right. Praise the Lord. All right. So I've debated on exactly how I was going to approach this tonight, and you'll find out why here in just a minute. I have kind of debated on it because we're now getting into the end of the tribulation. We're going to start talking tonight about Re Revelation chapter 6, and I'm going to read, and probably not get too deep into it, honestly, but we're going to read in Daniel chapter number 9, 24 to 27. Uh, as, we, as we probably know, based on who, who I know we're visiting with tonight, um, as we probably know, Daniel and Ezekiel both deal with end time events and prophetic, prophetic things that they share. And what we're going to look at tonight, these, first, these few verses here at the outset, lead us into chapter 6 because it is, a, it is the parallel. It's, the, it's the, um, the word that gives us that. Now, I'll be honest with you, there's some of this that I look at and I'm like, okay, I get this, I understand this, I kind of see where he's coming from, what he's talking about. And there's some of it I look at and I'm like, okay, um, it's there, I get it, I understand it's part of the word. But at the end of the day, do I fully understand it to a place where I feel confident totally teaching it and, and dealing with it and I and I'll just tell you the truth there's there's parts of it that I'm going to read and I and I will tell you like I told you I, I was going to do that I'll look at it I'll read it and I'm like I don't know because I don't and if somebody else does then please speak up because I, I want to hear it or hear your opinion or your impressions of it or what have you and what we're getting into the, in the interesting 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 thing about it if I can say my words is that there is no wrong answer because nobody does know and I'll give you an example of that here. As, as a matter of fact, some of the, the scholarship as far as the commentaries on the, the, what we're going to look at in chapter 6 in a few minutes, it absolutely, there, there's one group thinks this, another group thinks that, and there's other people that kind of think this and that and kind of a, a mixture of both. And, and um, I'll tell you what I think I see there, and, and we'll, we'll come to some conclusion on some of it and other parts of it. We'll be like, I don't know, it's hard to say. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, this is, for the record, Lesson 51, I believe. I think we did 50 last week, 51 or 52. Since I'm not doing a study sheet that I hand out at this point because there's just not really anything to put on one like we had with the Greek words and what have you, um, I, don't, I don't have a study sheet, so I, I lose track of what lesson I'm on, which I don't think it matters to anybody but me. But anyway, so the tribulation period is what we're going to start talking about tonight because this chapter 6 ushers it in. But let's look at Daniel chapter number 9. 24 to 27, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up prophecy, vision of prophecy, excuse me, and to anoint the most holy, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Father, touch us through it and help us to understand your word. We'll give you the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what I just read to you is, is a picture of the tribulation from Daniel's standpoint way 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 back and when you start looking at the the breaking of the first seal which we're going to look at here in chapter 6 just in a minute in Revelation and we start thinking this about these things that are coming the reason that that Daniel is included here is because this is what we're about to talk about this is what this is a a older prophecy of of what we're about to get into so you know, this day of calamity, day of wrath, all those kind of things, the day of Jacob's trouble, the vengeance of our God, time of trouble, all of those are scriptural phrases that we have that talk about the, the tribulation, that talk about the day, the day that's, that's out ahead of us still yet. And in the New Testament, there's a bunch of those, 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 um, those words that we find or phrases we find. 
uh, in the King James Bible, you see in several places, in Matthew chapter 24, 21 is one of them, where the word, actual word tribulation is used. And so, you know, we, we understand that there is coming that tribulation. There is coming a very, very horrible time, period of history that this world has never seen, has never understood. Think about the ground zero of the worst of the worst of the worst doesn't hold a candle in my and to what I believe is going to come when the tribulation actually occurs. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be worse than worse. It's going to be a bad period of history. It, there's so much about it that Scripture does give us, and I really think that as bad as it as bad as it seems and as good imagination as we may have, and even think about. Um, you know, think about some of the things that have happened in this world, wars that have happened, and you had people in uh, various places that, you know, they experienced it firsthand. England, I mean, they they bombed England for, or London for, I don't, I don't even remember the number. Somebody may be able to tell me right off the top of your head, but they bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed. I mean, just went on and on and on. And as bad as that was on those poor people there, I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine that even still being as bad as what we're going to talk about. Just starting to talk about tonight for the tribulation period. And, you know, the question, I think, one of the questions you come up with is, well, why, why is it, why do we, we think it's going to be so bad? And why does the Bible say what it says? I think it tells us that so that if people aren't loved and wooed into the kingdom of God, it'll scare them into it. You know, and here's the thing. I, I've heard preachers say this kind of stuff, and I'm one, you all know me by now, I'm one, I'd, I'd much rather love somebody in the kingdom. Just love on them and have them understand the love of Jesus and, and how awesome it's going to be, how incredible heaven's going to be, and how awesome it is to live this life and to, to enjoy the blessings of God and to, to know what we know and live what we live here and now and the hope we have of heaven, all of that, that's fantastic. But you know as well as I do, some people, they need to be, they need to be afraid. They need to, be, they need to understand, okay, well, that's all well and fine. There's your positives, but what if I don't? Because what do you hear in popular culture? It's always been this way, and, it's, and it's, it seems, it's got, seems to me like it's gotten worse. Maybe not gotten worse, it's just more publicized because of television and Internet and all the media, the way that, that we get hit from every angle of it these days, um, like nobody has in history really before us, is, you know, they talk about, you know, hell, you know I'll see you in hell, it's going to be a party. They say things like that, and it's like, <laughs> no, you don't know. You have no idea. And I believe the Bible gives us a pretty, a pretty fair and a good picture of hell. If it's going to be miserable and terrible and awful, worm dieth not, and you're going to suffer, you're going to be, of course, I still say the worst thing is you're going to be totally 100% alone, and you will have no, uh, no hope of anything. And the absence of the presence of God totally, completely is going to be, it's going to make it so miserable. There's no hope. There's no future. There's nothing but alone. At the same time, you will be, I think you'll be aware of misery going on around you. You'll certainly be aware of the misery going on in your own body and your own eternal existence, however, that, however that, that, that's going to play out. We don't know, I mean, we don't have 100% certainty on all that, but we know you will live forever um, one way or the other. You're, you will live in eternity in heaven in a splendor, splend, splendiferous, wonderful place. I don't think that's a real word, but I've heard other people say it, so I'll throw it out there, splendiferous. Um, sounds good. I like it. And uh, and at the same time, hell is going to be worse than anybody could ever think or imagine. I don't think that you. I don't think there's an expression in this world that would equal what hell is going to be. I just don't think it's possible uh, because it's so bad that we don't have words for it. And it's like kind of like I think heaven is going to be so incredible we don't have words for it. We can't fully describe it. John, which we'll get later on in the chapter, we'll get into the fun, what I call the fun parts of <laughs> Revelation uh, when we get on farther, deeper into the book, where you start seeing, you know, the city four square, and you're seeing these foundations and the walls and the gates and all that, all the beauty of it. Even then, I can't, I've got a great imagination. I can tell you, I've got a really good one. I, and sometimes it, even, it comes out in a message or what have you. But to get in my brain, even in my deepest imagination, the idea of one pearl being big enough to be a gate and being what, I mean, being what in my mind what a pearl is and having it be that big and that beautiful and that incredible, it's like, I'm just going to have to see it. I'm going to have to see it. I, I cannot get there. And I do have a theory. I don't know if I've shared this here or not. If I have, just overlook me because I do that. But, but I have a theory on why heaven, when it's depicted in a movie or in a, 
in some, some way that they try to depict it, what do they have? Clouds, a little fluffy, maybe a gate, maybe the, the, you know, the, the, the heaven's gate there with Peter standing behind a lectern like this, taking names, you know, what's your name, whatever, you know, and uh, that, that kind of imagery is all we get. Because I don't think there's anybody that can do it justice. Whatever they produce, whether it's a painting, whether it's a digital image that they create on a computer, whatever they do, it's not going to be even close. It's going to be that much more incredible. So anyway, so the tribulation period is what we're getting into. And, and, and like I said, we're just going to get started on it tonight. I don't know how far we'll get here. I plan on getting through the, the four horsemen is where I'm trying to get through tonight. But I, I make no promises because this is such, this is, to me it's such interesting interesting stuff that we're going to look at here for the next little while for these next few chapters that getting getting stuck somewhere and talking something out and talking about stuff i think it's just kind of it's just one of those things i think is really fun to do um when you get people started talking about scripture and, and you get deep into something really gets good now a couple things about this i'm going to throw this out here because it it's it's something people get get kind of hung up on he talks about the 77s, and he talks about the 62 weeks and the 7 weeks and these weeks and that. The, the point of all that is, and again, this is, this, this is a, a issue of this is what was translated and this is what actually that breaks down to. So to understand the time element here, the Hebrew word translated 7 actually means a unit of 7 rather than 7 days. So when you're talking about 70 weeks, it's a, it's a unit of seven and not necessarily seven days. Um, the, the actual Greek, and, or the, excuse me, not the Greek, but the Hebrew uh, is the word heptads, and that, that goes back into. So when it's translated, um, I'll just read for you what I have here. So we have, you know, it's kind of like in English, you say if I have a dozen, well, that could mean a dozen weeks, a dozen years. If I have a gross, well, that's a dozen, dozen. And, you know, so it's, it's the same same kind of, thing in this so this this 70 and 62 and all those things that the bottom the bottom line issue of this thing comes back to this this seven year period where there's going to be a a well the his the, the future history of it there will be a peace treaty signed between Israel and essentially the world um, and from that time the peace treaty is signed for seven years and our Christ will be in charge of the world one world church, one world government, one world everything, and every kingdom will bow to him, every kingdom will submit to him. Um, we've talked about before how the United States has to fall, and it looks like we're doing a good job of getting on that, getting on that, band, that, that train right now um, in a lot of ways, but the United States cannot be a world player. I don't believe that the U.S. president, even though there's been some reputable pastors and ministers over the course of the last 40 years, that have tried to say it was going to be this one and that one and another one, which, are, which were American presidents, well, at least one for sure. Um, but anyway, is it possible it could be an American? Yes, because we're a melting pot of the world. But, but regardless, it's going to be somebody from the old Holy Roman Empire, and I do agree with what LaHaye and Jenkins talks about in those Left Behind books as well as in, because LaHaye is the author of one of my resources I use for this, that it that it will be someone from Romania, that part of the world, that that eastern um, eastern block of Europe, and right there on the between Europe and, and Asia, and, and it's it's going to be that part of the world. That, but th that goes, in, and I don't I don't have in front of me right here, right handy, exactly what scripture gives us that thought and gives us that idea. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, we may come across that, but I don't have it for tonight. So figuring out these dates, looking at these things. And understand these, these weeks and this 70 weeks he's talking about and all this stuff that, that Daniel gives us. I'm going to do this and then we'll get into actually getting into Revelation here pretty quick. So I don't want to get in the weeds with this. We can discuss it if you feel like you want to. I, I'm not going to say we're not going to. But, but regardless of this, we're talking about the period of history from Daniel through now. I mean, there, there's, a whole, there's a whole range of everything. Because some of what Daniel talks about has happened. Some of this prophecy has taken place. Because you can look into some of the issues. Again, I'm not going to dig into the depth of it tonight because that's not the point. I threw this in here just to understand that there will be there will be an Antichrist who will be a part of that Roman Empire that will come to come to pass. Now, on that note, and a lot of a lot of your Bible scholars feel the same way about this, and I agree with them. There have been Antichrists, plural, over the course of the last several thousand years. 
Alexander the Great. He was a conqueror and an and a or, evil, horrible guy. Uh, you can go, that's why even all of Hitler, you can go, I think, even go into modern times with somebody like Saddam Hussein, that you can see them as a conqueror, as an evil that shows up and shows up on the scene. But I'll say this about the Antichrist. Now, here's, here's what I think. This, my, this is my opinion based on Scripture and based on what I think I've come to understand. As bad as, I say, throw one of them in there. doesn't matter. Alexander the Great, any of the Caesars that were horrible, terrible, that even that persecuted the church, the early church, um, going up into history through um, Stalin, Mussolini, any of those, any of those Pol Pot who killed millions of his own people in the, the, the in Cambodia, anybody like that, you name it, horrible, terrible, awful. Uh, Hitler was probably in our certainly in our time. He's the most despicable, awful. Killed killed so many people, primarily Jews, but lots of other people. Did everything he could do to kill everybody he could kill, and. Absolutely, he was an antichrist in the pattern of this. But like I said a while ago about the tribulation, about how wonderful heaven is, how bad hell's going to be, what I, what I believe is is that the, you, if you know history and you think of the worst of those people that I've mentioned or somebody I didn't even think of, you think of the worst of those people. Let's just take Hitler. As bad as he was, as terrible as he was, the horrible, horrible human being that he was, pure evil, he will not be anything close to what the Antichrist himself will be when he comes on the scene. Two reasons. Number one, it's going to be a different age, a different period of history. The technology that he'll have available to him, which I, like I say, it could happen today. This could, this could all begin to unfold today, and it may still be a thousand years. I don't know, and, I, and like I said, don't, I don't concern myself with when. I do what Jesus said do. I'm ready. You know, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, I've got to be ready. So, and we all do, and that's, that's the bottom line. But, what I was get what I where I was heading there, and I, I lost myself for a second. But, but when you get down to it, you're going to have three and a half years from based on what we'll see here in Revelation, as well as other sources probably. But Revelation, three and a half years, where you will have the Antichrist, who is a human being in this world, who has risen to power, who has become the leader of the world, right? Uh, plain and simple. Three and a half years in, he'll be killed, martyred. Well, to show that he, to fool the world into thinking he is divine and that he even is Messiah, after three days he will rise again. When he rises again, Satan incarnate. He will be the devil in the flesh, walking this earth. For three and a half more years he will rule. You're taught, that's when you start getting into, um, which we'll see all this, and I don't want to get it too far ahead of myself here. That's when you start dealing with the mark of the beast. That's when you start dealing with worshiping him because he will be an object of worship. Like I, said, I don't know if, if, if all of y'all that, and everybody, and i got a couple folks watching online with us, I don't know if you've read the, the Left Behind books. I recommend them. Again, it's scriptural. It's, it's, it's biblical fiction based on scripture. I don't, you know, if the Antichrist ends up being named Nikolai, that was just a great shot in the dark for, for Lay and Jenkins. I mean, it's just that, it's just that simple. But, but uh, it's, sure, it's possible, but... Uh, you know, and if, if somebody like the head of the United Nations the next few years shows up and he's from Romania and his name's Nikolai, I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. You know, this is something. Get ready, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'll spend most of the time praying and, uh, you know, just, just do that. But, but in all seriousness, the, the Antichrist, when he does come on the scene, the worst of the worst will not compare because he will be so vicious that nobody will nobody will refuse him. If if they do, it'll be no problem. I don't care if there's cameras on him. He's in the middle of a press conference. He's going to be so vicious and so so hard, and yet so compassionate. He's going to have Christ-like traits, but he's going to be so manipulative and so controlling that if he's in the middle of a press conference and one of his somebody somebody offends him, a a a, 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 a journalist asks him a wrong question. It would not be it would not be an issue whatsoever, and nobody blink an eye if he told his one of his guys said, "Hey, I'm not I'm not answering that. Shoot him," and they just drag the body out, clean up the blood. That's the kind of stuff that I see in my mind that the Antichrist will do and get away with, because he is there. He's going to be the savior of the world. Now I do agree with, and I'll, I'll go ahead and deal with this right here. And we may not even get to Revelation six, and I'm going to try to. But give me just give me a second to lay the, lay the foundation here. I think about him that. The, the idea of him being reluctant, 
You know, well, I'll do it for the good of the world. I, I really don't know that I'm qualified. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too something else. But if this is what you want, I'll do it. And he will slide into place. And then all of a sudden, he's going to go from, well, you know, I sure care about all of y'all. We want to make the world a better place. And we're going to do this and that. And he's going to take everybody's weapons. He's going to take everybody's arms. All the nuclear weapons will be destroyed. Yeah, he'll be a politician. I mean, he'll be sly. And even, even LaHaye and Jenkins, I like one of the ways that they kind of portray it with the mind control stuff because I think he'll have that kind of power and that kind of ability, whether you call it witchcraft or whatever you want to call it. I do think he'll be able to take and shoot somebody, him, even from his own hand, shoot him in cold blood, and then stand there and look, and look around the room and say, okay, wasn't that terrible? He, had, he tried to attack me, and I had, to, I had to shoot my friend. I didn't want to do that. That's, what, that's one of the ways it's, it's done. And one of the books we've listened to and read, um, dealing with end time stuff and dealing with the Antichrist and that kind of stuff. And he's, he, he's going to have power. He's going to have ability. And he's gonna need, but he'll need that in order to accomplish God's purpose. And see, people get hung up on this stuff, and, and I'm going to tell you this. Uh, and I may have got into this before, but, but here's the thing about it. You know, we struggle with, well, why would God let, and this happened over this election, why would God let them come to power? Do you think God wasn't on the job whenever Pol Pot came into power? I mentioned a while ago, killed in the killing fields of Cambodia, killed millions of his own people. His own people. This wasn't even going to war against somebody else. This is his folks. Um, you know, that God wasn't paying attention when Hitler killed all of his chosen people. I mean, you know, not all of them, but all those people he killed is what I mean. Um, that God wasn't, you know, God wasn't paying attention during whatever, whatever period you want to name where there's been horrible, awful things that have happened to humanity. Um, you know, you think God wasn't paying attention with all that's going on? Go all the way back in the Bible when the children of Israel were in captivity. Who, who allowed um, Xerxes or Darius or um, um, Babylonian Empire, um, Nebuchadnezzar? Who allowed those people to come to power that eventually would enslave his people? God did. God allowed that. Of course, part of that was judgment. And, you know, they, they kind of made their bed and had to lay in it. But, but all of that, so the idea that an unholy or ungodly, even though they may claim to be godly, or claim, claim to be Christian at least in some way, the idea of them coming to, coming to power here, there, yonder, should not be a foreign concept to us. And like I said, I was really, I didn't comment, I left it alone. A couple of the preacher, you know, AG pastors or lead pastors, a couple, a couple pages I'm on that are private groups where we can kind of talk amongst ourselves and not, not have, you know, it, it's all pastors. You have to be an ordained minister, and some of them you have to be a pastor, and it's a closed group. And they get to talking about some of this stuff, and one of them actually made the statement that, well, he's not my president, because I just don't believe since he stole it. Since he stole the election, I don't believe God put him there. I don't care how he got there. I don't like how he got there, if in fact all any of that's true. But I will say that I, but if he's there, it's because God allowed him to be there. May have even promoted him there. If you want to go down to it, you know, the Bible tells us that nobody's in authority without his approval. may not be his endorsement, let's be honest. There's a difference between endorsement and approval. Without God allowing them to rise to power, they're not in power. And that's, that's troubling sometimes. Because you look like, I mean, God, really, a Pol Pot, really? Why would you allow that? Go to Ethiopia, go to Libya, go to some of these places where you've had these horrible people that just, and, and who's their target a lot of times? Christians and Jews. Who's the number one target for these people? You're like, okay, God, you know, but let's don't forget, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. To be absent of the body, to be present in the Lord. So in order to accomplish that person going to heaven when they went, God said, this is when I want you to come home. So, it, you know, is that, is that we like, we, do we like that? No, we don't like that. But there's got to be somewhere in there as believers in Jesus Christ that we come to the place where we're like, that may not be the way we'd want to do it, but that's God has God's made this happen. God has allowed this to happen at least in, in these in various situations. So, all right, so Revelation chapter 6. We'll go ahead and get started here. I should have time to get through because these, these, these four horsemen get, move pretty quick, actually, once we get, get started on them here. But... Um, some of the, something really important about this I think is good. Um, in chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 16, these are all passages and, and chapters of Revelation that deal with tribulation, the tribulation period itself, the seven-year period. 
So in chapter 6, we start seeing the seal judgments, and then the seventh, after the seventh seal, you have the trumpets, and after that, you have the bowls. And all of that, all of those things go in, in sequence. And kind of going back again to some of the stuff that, that Bible scholars come up with and people that study this stuff out, you've got some that think, well, the bowls, excuse me, the, the, the seals and the bowls and the trumpets all happen at the same time. They're all, they're all together. Well, if, you look, if we're going to look at it, we're going to approach it from the standpoint of you have the seals, then you have the trumpets, and then you have the bowls. And, and, and they're not happening at the same time. They happen, they follow each other throughout the seven-year period. And uh, so a couple things about Daniel here. Let me, I'm going to just run down a couple quick things about this. And this is from Daniel. Um, and I won't go back and, and pull these, these exactly which verse they come out of, if you don't mind. Uh, number one, to finish the transgression. And this has to do with the transgression of Israel and the rejection of Messiah. Uh, number two, put an end to sin. This word put an end is literally to seal up. So Satan is bound and sin will be sealed up because he will be bound. So that speaks even to the end of the tribulation period. Uh, number three, to atone for wickedness. That was, that was uh, part of Daniel. And this has to do with the revival of Israel. Israel being atoned for and Israel accepting the atonement. Uh, because just like we accept our salvation, Israel had to accept their atonement, right? So uh, this, and therefore you bring everlasting righteousness. This is the revival of Israel as well as uh, whosoever will, I believe, when you come down to it. Uh, but remember, Daniel is writing this. This is a prophecy, prophetic word co coming to Israel, so it's pretty, pretty key there. Um, number five, he sealed up vision and prophecy. So when Israel has come to Christ, there's no more need for prophets, no more need for prophecy or visions or anything else. Uh, number six, to anoint the most holy. Of course, this takes us to Mount Moriah, where Solomon's temple is, and this is the, the ultimate the ultimate crowning, if you will, uh, in a manner of speaking of Jesus. So we talked about the, uh, the, the tribulation period. A couple of theories on this. And I, I, I just, I'm, not, I'm not sure we're going to get to Revelation here, but we'll, we'll try. Um, a couple of theories on this. Who will, who will come against Israel? Basically the world. Because even if, well, let me phrase it. I want, I want to get this. Just, I want to say it the way I want to say it here. Israel will have no defenders at this point. We will either, as a nation, which we support Israel now, and there's lots of lots that do, when it comes down to this time, there will be nobody stand with Israel, and there will absolutely be those who will stand against Israel. Two predominant theories that I've heard is Russia and the, the, the Arab nations will come together They'll, join, they'll, they'll, they'll form a, an alliance, and they'll go against Israel. The other is that China will have an alliance with the Arab nations, and they'll go against Israel. Both of those make sense. Both those are, both those are distinct possibilities. It's possible Russia, China, gets together and gets with them. <laughs> it, whatever happens, Israel will be the target, and most of, the world will essentially be against Israel, and nobody will stand with them. That's that's what's going to bring in. That's what's going to bring in the peace treaty between Israel and the world uh, that will that will bring all this into fruition. But the uh, couple of interesting interesting things about it that we'll that we'll talk about over the course of these these this part of the study is that you have you you have a world that has totally turned their back on Israel for whatever reason. Now here's here's a thought that I that I've I've thought about before, never have really talked it out. When Israel winds up standing alone, have they offended people? Have they offended the rest of the world in some way, done something that the rest of the world doesn't like? Or has it just come to the place where just the world has turned for whatever reason? Um, is it the Arab influence, which goes all the way back to, we know, Abraham, or, uh, um, um, yeah, Abraham with um, um, Hagar and, and Sarah and all the way back to, to that? And uh, up until this point, because there's always been that 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 conflict that's gone on there, and it's going to keep it's going to continue on all the way to the end. But um, what happens? What takes place? Or is it just finally just somebody says, "We don't like what Israel. We don't like who you are. Don't like what you're doing. We don't like you know." Because because now what do we have currently, we've got the the settlements in Gaza, which is a huge bone of contention, a big issue, and that's what they all that's what they all want all want to talk about. And they want to have the Palestinians.
Palestinian state and the Israel state, and they want to do all this stuff. And Israel says no, and eventually maybe the world's just going to finally say, well, fine, if you're not going to do that, we're done with you. You've got to bend here. You've got to work with us. And truth of the matter is, based on this, they ain't got to do nothing. They don't have to bend. They don't have to do anything. That's their land. God gave them that land. Now, the problem comes in is that you have a lot of people who don't see it God's way. A lot of people. You've got most of the world that doesn't see it God's way. So, eventually, and that's what's going to turn it. I really think it's something like that's what's going to turn it. That Israel is going to stand their ground and say, you know, God gave us this land. And maybe even take more of what God gave them. Because you understand that right now the actual Israel proper, the, Israel, the, the boundary lines of Israel itself, that's not everything listed that was promised to them, that, that they took from the Canaanites, right? You get that. There, it's different. I, if I thought about it, I had, I'd, I'd put up a map. That there, there, there's, there's what Israel has now and that there's, there's other parts of that that they don't, they don't possess. Um, maybe they'll decide, okay, well, this is what, this is the boundaries that Joshua marked out, so we want this, we want this, and we want this. Maybe that'll bring it. I don't know. Um, the, one of the best theories, I think, on, on the Temple Mount now, where the temple will be, rebuilt sets the dome of the rock dome of the rock is a islamic site that is an islamic shrine and for prophecy to be totally fulfilled which can happen and just it's quick with technology and with everything else that dome of the rock can be moved in a heartbeat and they can get busy and they can put this stuff up i've heard more than once from more than one source that they are training levites that they are constantly looking for a red heifer that they are doing, it's so cool that modern technology has done stuff that you just, you just think about. They have the materials stored somewhere. I don't know where, and I, that I don't have. But when DNA technology started becoming, becoming reliable, where you could look and they could check somebody, they started testing people. And if their, if their genes were the Levites, and there's a distinct one for the Levites, isn't that cool? There's one that's distinct for the Levites. When they figure out they're a Levite, they give them the opportunity to start training for the priesthood. And so they're setting up. They're getting ready. And that's got to happen. At some point before three and a half years into the tribulation. See, they'll have three and a half years. Even if they haven't touched anything before the tribulation period starts, they'll have three and a half years to build that temple. Why does that temple matter? I bet you know this, but I'll throw it in here anyway. I'm, I, I'm scattered. I'm scattered tonight. I don't mean to be. I apologize for that. I'm kind of going back and forth and throughout this whole thing. When the Antichrist is killed, it will be because he went and desecrated the temple. LaHaye and Jenkins, I, you know I'm going to use this a lot. Their image is that he rides, that the Antichrist rides into the temple on a pig and slaughters that on the altar. Ooh, don't you know that didn't set well? Or won't set well, excuse me. It won't set well. And right after that is whenever he's killed and, and then he, you know, he resurrects and, and he's Satan incarnate. The, but, so they've got three and a half years from... If, if, it, if it all went down today, they'd have three and a half years to build that temple. Because the temple has to be there in order for that part of the prophecy to come to pass. And again, we'll see that. We'll see that's in Revelation. We'll see that as we go, um, as we get along through this. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still looking at things that I, in parts of my notes here that I'm like, okay, well this, this is something I want to talk about, but I want to get to six, and I'm not going to get there. It's, it's, quarter, it's quarter till now. So... Um, couple things here let's go ahead let's just kind of keep talking about this and then we'll get to chapter six next week I just because I, I don't want to start on chapter six and just do like one horse and then be be finished so the tribulation period if what we believe is true we've talked we have talked about this I'm not getting deep I won't, we won't dig into this too deep but if we if what we believe that the pre-tribulation rapture is the biblical stand and what have we talked about? Again, you guys are always here, and, and I see Lori's with us online. Hi, Lori. Um, that all three have, well, let me phrase it this way. You can't totally discount any of the three of pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation rapture. You can't discount any of them, any one of them completely and totally and say, nope, that's not possible. You can't do it. You can have your personal feelings, which we our fellowship, I mean, people a lot smarter than me that studied this stuff out when they put together our 16 fundamental truths and our position papers and all that kind of stuff. They make a great argument. I've studied it. I've read it. I've looked at it. I've preached once or twice from what our fellowship puts out on that. 
talking about end time events and stuff. And some of what I'll do here, we'll talk about that. But the the most likely scenario is pre-tribulation rapture. And I'll be honest with you, part of that is we're hoping for a pre-tribulation rapture. Let's just be blunt about it. We hope that's true. What if it's not? We'll be okay. What if we miss it? We'll be okay if we put our faith in Jesus. Um, so pre-tribulation rapture is where we're going to approach this from for the most part. Um, I may mention the mid or the post once in a while, but um, if anything is, if you could actually hang your hat on anything and say this is what it's going to be, it may be that there's going to be all three. You'll have a pre-tribulation rapture for all those that are ready now, a mid-tribulation rapture to keep those that get saved during the first three and a half years, and then those that, that got saved even through the worst of the worst, which is, which, I mean, when the devil is on the earth running the show, that's going to be the worst. It's got to be. That's going to be the time. It's going to be so hard. But even during that time, there will be people who will come to Christ. And that's, man, I, I can't imagine. But, I, but that's, that's going to be the only option uh, at that point in history. But so we believe pre-tribulation rapture. What's going to usher that? It's going to be something happens to Israel. The world attacks Israel. And um, First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 10, the Lord Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. Um, Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 talks to the, the church at Philadelphia which you already looked at, looked at says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently I also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole earth uh, to test those who live on the earth so what he wrote to the, what he said excuse me to the church at Philadelphia gives us an indication that he's going to take the church out of here and uh, we, we trust and hope that's true so you know it still amazes me, and I, I got challenged on this a few weeks ago because I was talking, I, I, I posted something on there about come quickly, Lord Jesus, or something, and, and had a well-meaning person who is a minister that, um, not one of, not in the sense of God minister, but he did question, so well, that's, he said, the only problem is that's not really true, it's not what the Bible says, and I'm like, what Bible are you I just I was confused, I, I didn't blow him out publicly, I didn't bust him up publicly, I, I, I sent him a private message and said, okay, here's where I'm coming from, and I give him scripture, and I give him Give him some, some sound teaching on it, but he's, like I say, he's convinced there's not going to be one. And there are some Assemblies of God people who don't believe there's going to be a rapture. And I'm like, I don't, I'm pretty sure you need to get your Bible out and check it again. And that's, again, I don't mean to sound harsh about it because that's just not my nature. But, but it's like, you know, if Jesus Christ is in your heart and soul, I mean, let, let's just, I don't have, again, I don't have specific scripture, but just things I know from memory, just like you do. You know, why would he say that? The day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, and that we need to be ready, you know, if being ready wasn't going to be our way out of here and not have to deal with all that kind of stuff. It, I mean, it's just, it's just simple logic on that. And I said part of it is faith. I have faith in Jesus that he's not going to, he's not going to put us through that. And again, I, I am convinced 100% based on what we see in the word and how the world is setting up that we, that, that the, the tribulation period will make, this is going to be a bold statement, I'm going to say it anyway. Think about what we know from history and what we do even have from some documentary stuff and what have you that was done, that's been done, as bad as Hiroshima or Nagasaki was. I don't think, it's, I don't think it'll compare. I think those days were bad and terrible for those people, of course. Don't, don't diminish that at all. But this world will be worse. Let's, let's look at these people. For those people that survived that, because people did survive that, for those people in those places that survived that, I still think that their life was easier. And again, not diminishing their suffering at all. Would never do that. That their life was easier than what it will be to live through the tribulation. Yeah, it's global. Yeah, actually, there's lots of reasons why I think that. But I think that this, the Antichrist is going to be so vicious, evil, horrible, at the same time seeming like a saint, seeming like a savior, but he'll be able to do things just because people trust him, people put their confidence in him, they put their faith in him, they will. I mean, he's going to be worshipped. The church, the one world church will worship him. That will be the world system of worship. And it's, it's just really, uh, it's really kind of scary. But in, in conclusion for tonight, I want to think about it this way, and, and again, these are things we've talked about before, and I realize that, but it, I think it's a good spot to throw it in here in closing for tonight. Go back 
I think you can go back before 9-11, 2001, and have a discussion like this and think about it and say, okay, well, and I, this is where I come from, and maybe you feel differently, but this is what I think. The world was not at a place for the Antichrist to rise to power. You've got the Russians, you've got the Chinese, you've got the United States, you've got England, you've got Britain, you've got, I mean, even then you've got England, Ireland, um, Scotland right there together, and then you've got uh, Spain and Italy and, and Germany and, and all these, you know, all these major countries, world powers, and all these places and all these things, all these, these governments who all of them are looking out for number one and who all of them are taking care of themselves. And, of course, then you have the United States who's taking care of everybody. We have in some way, shape, or form over, over you know, modern history, but uh, for an awful lot of them, I mean, we still got military bases all over the world where we're providing security for these places. And that's, I mean, that's just the truth of it. But go back. Here's, this, is where I, this is where the break is for me. Prior to 9-11, if we were having this discussion, and, we, and I asked the question, do you think that this world is ready for one world leader, one world church? Are we at that place? Now, you may have felt differently, but if you'd asked me that objectively in 2000, I'd have said no. I said, look at where we are. Look at who we are. I say you've got this. You got you got had, had I don't know how many. You break it down to how many actual world powers there were. I mean, you definitely have Russia. You have um, uh, United States, and you had China. Um, and I think you could logically get there with some of the other European nations and all that. You know, those places. Some of the some of the African nations are major major players uh, on world stage, world events, and, and you know if something happened there, it was a big deal everywhere. Middle East, all of that, right? You had all those different all those different players, all the different pieces, all those different all the different things going on. But after 9/11, the whole world, like him or not, or whether, whatever you think of him, doesn't really matter. The whole world was listening to George Bush. He was calling the shots. If he had wanted to to level Baghdad. He could have done it. Now, there had been folks not like it because they didn't like what we did anyway. But nobody, they wouldn't have hauled him off to, to, to the Hague for, uh, for you know, war crimes or anything like that. They wouldn't have hauled him off and tried to do anything about it because he was in charge. And then now look what we got. We've got the European Union. We've got, we've got you. of course, we've always had these, what, the G8 and the G7s and the G this and G that, you know, World Health Organization, UN, NATO, all these organizations. And all of those, all of those, set us up for one world. The European Union, I'm telling you, when that went down, I'm sitting there like, wow, there it is. I'm seeing this. And we've been seeing it for a long time, but still, I mean, it's just the coolest thing because when all of this starts happening, then that sets the stage for the whole world just come together and say, here we are, one world government, one world currency. That, that subject's coming up more, come up more than once in recent history. Well, if we all just have the same money, and what's setting up for that? Bitcoin. Bitcoin, something like that's going to be your money. It, whether you like it or don't, it's going to get pretty soon where George Washington ain't going to mean anything to nobody but our history. And that's, that's, that's a fact. So think, give me just a second. Things like Bitcoin. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, Everybody's at the point, everybody has to have the mark to buy or sell. Mm -hmm. And your Bitcoin account will be, will be... And you see our country, where we're headed, financially down the tube. Yeah, no question. And then I think all around the world will be like that. Yep. And so they will come up with this plan. That, yeah, everybody, we're, we'll take care of everybody, and you're going to worship. Right. That's it. You know, and you look at, you look at where things are right now. Look at what COVID... Turn this back on. Look at what COVID has done. COVID has taken this place, and and I was kind of I was a little bit like, okay, let's calm down a little bit. When you know they started this thing, well, you know, there's a change shortage, and use your credit card if you if you if at all possible at, at stores and stuff, you know, because that's yours. It's in your pocket. You don't touch anything. You're not handing them something you've had in your possession or that you know who knows what you've done with that. I mean, it's you know it's cash money, and and they've done. <laughs> They've done a few tests on money a time or two and found some pretty terrifying things on, on, on cash money um, that, uh, you know, anytime you handle it, the Bible calls it filthy lucre. I'm pretty sure that's 100% true of it. I don't know what lucre is, but it's, it's gross, I think, is what I'd say. But uh, something nasty. But 
but it all comes back again to what are we leading into? We are leading into a place where it's one money, and whether you call it a dollar or whether you call it a a nickel or whether you whatever you call it, wherever you are in the world. Well, as a matter of fact, when I was when I've been overseas, when I needed to get money, you know what I got out of my wallet? One of my cards, and I stuck my card in an ATM machine, and, or I gave them my card, and they run it through their little machine in in Asia and other in, in uh, other places I've been, and didn't didn't have any trouble at all. It ran right through, and it come money coming right out of the bank account that I had there in Arkansas. Cause that's the last that's where I lived last time I was doing something like that. That's no problem. That is no problem whatsoever. So. Folks, we're living. We are living Scripture, and all this stuff, all the stuff that's going, that's coming, that's coming at us. All this, all this technology, and all these things, it doesn't. There, there's no question that the stage is set, and it may happen today. It may. You know, I always say it may happen a thousand years from now. I don't know, but I know I need to be ready because even if, even if it don't happen in my lifetime, when I die, if I'm not in Christ, then I'm, I'm, I'm up creek. And uh, that's I, we can't afford that. But you know, as as we as we finish up tonight, I need I need to to get, to get done. For one thing, I'm about to run out of time as far as our our stream goes because I've got that set up. I need to I need to add some time to that too. But we're usually done by this time. We are anyway. But but you know, we're we're there, and it shouldn't scare us. It should encourage us. It should bless us uh, that we are at that point. You know, I I want to see my grandkids grow up. I want to, you know, there's lots of things I'd like to see happen. But the cool thing is, if God carries us out of here, I'll be with them grandkids forever. I won't have to drive eight hours to go see them anymore. I'll be right there <laughs> and anytime I'm ready. And uh, that's, that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Yes, ma'am. Don't you think, though, before that time, before any, all the Christians get out of here, aren't we all going to suffer some persecution, even in the United States? I mean, I, I, I listened to a message tonight, a short one, and I put it on Facebook, but it's like you can start to, to see and feel that coming, and I, and I think it's going to be here, too. I, yep. I think, I think you're right. here like it's been other places. Well, one thing I've always said, now I do believe the trumpet can sound any second. I've, I've said that ever since I've been in ministry and begin to understand what the Word teaches on that, but I still hold out hope for a major big time revival before the trumpet sounds. Now I hope it does and God with it none would perish. So that's part of that's my logic. It's not it's logic and faith kind of put into a package together. But I'll tell you, you know, it, the trumpet can sound any second now. But if it doesn't, if we're persecuted, we're a good company. You know, we ought to be able to do like the like the church in the book of Acts and rejoice that we were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. But I can tell you, you talk about a cull in the herd, when things start getting tough, There'll be lots of folks that I don't you know. I, if, if Jesus loves me, I'm not going to do that. If Jesus loves me, I won't have to deal with that. And that's that's not what the Bible teaches at all. So whatever we face, God will be with us through it, and I'm glad that He'll be with us through it, and uh, thankful for all of that. So well, let's pray tonight, and then we'll conclude our time together. And uh, for those that are watching online, thank you for being with us tonight. Appreciate you being here. If you see this later on YouTube or on the DVD when I make it for you. I uh, hope this blesses you tonight as well. And just some good discussion, good good conversation about this tonight. Next week we will get to, to Revelation chapter 6 and start talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. Touch us, God. Bless us and be with us. Be with us. Renew us. Encourage Renew us. us. Encourage us and edify us by your spirit and by your power. And we'll be careful to praise you and honor you, Lord, and help us to be ready no matter what comes our way and no matter what we face in this world. We give you the thanks and the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.